Kevin Frank's path to come to the national board was a little bit of serendipity. At one point in his life, Kevin lived in the Philadelphia area and he shared a property border with a gentleman by the name of Jim Saunders, who many of you know. Jim is a longtime act activist and advocate in the Philadelphia area uh, for people with hearing loss. And Jim was on the national board and in the fullness of time became the chair of the governance committee. And so he knew Kevin and he knew Kevin's connection with hearing loss, a professional connection. And he said, that's a man that we can get on the board. So that serendipity has been really important for us. Kevin brings so much experience and knowledge and goodwill to this job. And that's my introduction. Kevin Frank, we're really pleased to have you here. Um, so thank you for coming to listen today. Um, I wanna make this a bit enjoyable. When I had to think of a title, I was like, I don't know, some kind of update, um, research technology, I'll get to all of that. Um, but I'm gonna make it hopefully a little bit more fun and a little bit more st storytelling. Um, I've been lucky enough to work most of my career in the hearing space. And a lot of the work that I did ended up being technology and research that people are using or may not be, but is out there today. And so as much as it makes it seem all about me, but it is because you asked me to speak, I'm gonna go through some of my career as it pertains to research and technology related to people with hearing loss. So I'm the chair of the board of directors for the National HLAA organization. And that's, I, I gotta say of all the things I've done, it's one of the more enjoyable, rewarding, and important jobs. And so to have the chance to come to speak at a, at a New York convention is just a thrill for me because everything that HLAA does, it does for you and you do for it. Together, we are all HLAA, helping everyone just get by and, and more um, with hearing loss by, by being friends and connected to one another. So just a bit about me before we get started. This is my family. So my wife, who's just next to me, and I started in Boston today. And this morning drove to Burlington, Vermont to visit the one in purple who just set up her life there. She moved back from London and this was the first time we got to see her spot, which was great. And I'm gonna go back there tonight and go out to dinner. And that's my other daughter on the other side. <clears throat> I'm a motorcyclist. And what's interesting about this picture is I ride with my dog. And there he is getting his goggles on. Does he have a laser? So originally we were gonna ride here, but the plans changed. So he's up in Burlington, Vermont. And uh, so this is what I do for fun. And I'm also a gearhead. So I like taking apart things and putting them back together. And this car came into my life uninvited and uh, I managed to take it all apart put it back together and it's just starting to be able to move under its own uh, power, which I'm really proud about. So I'm gonna go through parts of this resume as part of this technology and industry update. And I'm also gonna, at the end, talk a little bit about HLAA's strategic imperatives of kind of what HLAA is gonna be up to for the next few years. My first big job was when I ran the cochlear implant program at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And my job was to do research on children. So that made part of it easy when you do the electrophysiologic nerve measurements where they don't even have to do anything. But if I wanted kids to do behavioral research, I needed to spend a lot of time with them. And kids don't spend a lot of time doing anything. So we invented some video games to trick kids into science. And we also figured out how to do telemedicine so kids could stay in their schools while having their cochlear implants programmed at home. This was in the early 2000s and it was a great job. I learned a lot, published some research, but the concept of people using video games and telemedicine sparked off a business plan to try to make cochlear implants less hospital centric 
and more distributed into communities so that people could do their own programming or work with schools or other local audiologists or whomever. So it wasn't so inconvenient to get this technology because the belief was part of the reason so many people don't get what they need is it can be difficult to get where the care is provided. So I wrote a business plan around that and then moved to Cochlear, I moved to Sydney to try to um, you know, not only make the next generation cochlear implant systems, but change the paradigm of care so that cochlear implants could be programmed in places outside of hospitals. And we did some really interesting research. Those cartoons were the ways that we would take people who knew nothing about our technology and say, what is that? How does it work? Where is it used? And we used the platform at the time, the Nucleus 5, to figure out what if we could make that remote control, how you program your own device? And what if we could make the software available for people who don't have audiologic training? This was in 2011. And the update is these tools just were introduced last year. So it took a little while for pieces of the software to become available 10 years later. Now, I'm going to diverge a little bit to when I left hearing altogether, and I worked as a consultant to hearing aid, uh, to, to drug companies. And one of the things that we were learning about is how do you quantify the benefit that a medical intervention has, and how do you make sure it's covered by health insurance? Now, the U.S. is a strange place for health insurance because it doesn't really use logic, and there are countries that use perhaps too much logic. I'm going to bring you through some of that logic. All right, so this is a voting exercise where I want a lot of class participation. So imagine there was a metric where zero is no health, no health utility. Essentially, you've passed away. And one is perfect health. So one is, I, got, I feel great. I've got no health concerns. And zero is the day that we pass. Pretty easy scale. And then time is on the x-axis. Right, so the day you're born, the day you die. Would you rather a life that starts, this is a tricky angle, that's, that starts near one and goes for quite some time and then your health drops right? and then you live a little while and then you pass or the life where you have just a brief moment where you're super healthy a quick drop, another drop, and you pass earlier. Who'd like A? Oh, that's not everybody. I'm really curious who'd like B. All right. So it's, it's pretty clear that A is better than B. And the difference between those curves, the difference between the integral of those curves is a quality-adjusted life year. And you can measure them. The space between those two lines is a metric of health utility. And the value of whatever could bring you from the blue line to the green line can be calculated based on the size of that space. And this is the math that some health insurance, some countries use to determine if things are covered or not. How about this one? Would you like this short burst of perfect health and then middle health for a long time? Or would you like decent health for most of your life and pass a little early? Who, who, wants, who wants the green one? How about the blue one? It's a harder equation, isn't it? If you do the math and add them up, they're equal. So this is a more difficult scenario to try to parse out. It demonstrates that this math, while useful, isn't perfect, but it can be, it can be helpful to guide healthcare decisions. So that utility is that single numeric representation of a health state. And when they do research, they come up with numbers around conditions. Now, I've not gone through menopause, I don't expect to, but if you ask many people who do, they say it's not that big a deal. In terms of health utility, it's hardly any decrement. Being confined to a hospital, people in, re 
people have reported research that says that's not good living. That's like a confined to a hospital. That may ring true. These other data have been measured using studies, each of the studies with their own imperfections, to understand the various utility of a chronic health condition. So if you express hearing loss, deafness, 0.43, two years living deaf is a 0.86 reduction in quality of life years, according to this math. So if you want to pay for a quality, well, how much is it worth? So if you have dialysis paid for by Medicare, that's around $50,000, at least when I wrote this slide. Um, that $50,000, because our government pays for that, is something that's considered useful to our insurance companies. Though our insurance companies never use this metric, you can see by evidence what they're willing to pay. If you ask a bunch of experts, they'd say $60,000 is what you should pay for a quality. The World Health Organization has a metric. The United Kingdom, that does health insurance purely by this method, uses a value of $38,000. Other countries have other numbers. So that's the cost that healthcare is willing to pay to satisfy a quality adjusted life year. Now, how much is the cost of a general practitioner to tell you to stop smoking? Not very expensive, $500. That's easy and it could save your life. So clearly that's something we should do because it's cheap and it could save a life. But what about if you have a malignant brain tumor in your head? You could pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to have the surgery, but it may not make any change to your quality adjusted life year. All these different things are costs that people have to consider of whether we all are gonna pay for others to have it done. That's what health insurance is after all. We all pay for other people to get care. So when you look at a cochlear implant, you ask the question, is a cochlear implant cost effective? It sure is, right? So the costs, around $35,000 $35, for the device itself, surgery, twice that if not more. And these processors cost around $10,000 every five years. So these are the costs, not to mention the costs of all the cables and time going to get them adjusted. So if you do that same math, you can quite easily determine that a cochlear implant for a child who gets a cochlear implant early, uses it their whole life, but has a bunch of costs that they spend and save, is very inexpensive. Remember those lines that we saw from Medicare were around $50,000. This is much, much cheaper. So it's a very good idea to give a cochlear implant to a child. And in fact, two cochlear implants is highly cost effective in almost every um, market that does this math. And so what do we see in almost every place that offers insurance? Two cochlear implants are covered for children. For adults, one cochlear implant, highly cost effective. But when you look at the line for bilateral cochlear implants, according to this math, it's not over the line. And many countries won't cover cochlear implants for a second cochlear implant for adults. Our country does because we don't use this logic. So this type of research, this type of math is useful when you look at all kinds of things, including hearing interventions. It's a way of looking at the world, which was very new to me. And I learned quite a lot about how you make decisions for very difficult things. There's so much incredible technology out there, health technology, but how do we get it all straight? How do we just decide who gets it? Now, I stopped working in hearing for a while and I got to work with people who had no um, legs, below knee amputations. And this was my boss, Hugh Herr. And uh, he had both of his, he lost both of his legs climbing Mount Washington. And he invented a, a bionic robot leg. And this leg, of course, was much more expensive than its prosthetic equivalent, but it promised to save the health 
of the other side, the other leg, so it could be used longer. Unfortunately, I don't think this added up to the, the health economics that we just spoke to. And the company went out of business. The technology was sold to a German company. Bionic hands are another area that has failed to take off. These technology, while they look anthropomorphic, don't work like they need to because it's so complicated to try to move your fingers and hands and feel and touch. And the benefit you get off what's out there now isn't worth the additional cost. And they too have struggled, these bionic hands have struggled to find a, a way to exist in the healthcare system. A company that grew right out of the cochlear implant is called the Bionic Eye. And this company too started off doing okay, but went out of business because it just simply couldn't provide enough benefit for the cost that it had. So I've been lucky enough to work not only in cochlear implants, but other types of bionic devices and have found that it's true that if you can't create your value in a way that's meaningful to everybody, your technology may not deserve to exist which is a harsh reality of doing business. So the next phase of my career was when I was moving back from Australia to work um, for these bionic leg companies. And a friend of mine said, hey, you need to join our little startup company because we think we found a way to get people to program their own hearing aids. And because part of the cost of hearing aids is getting it adjusted by an audiologist, this could be a way to make people hear for less money because they could serve themselves. And we had some research that was done that showed that when people used a simple interface like this, they could make measurements that were um, reliable. In other words, they could get the same measurements two or three times, and they could choose amplification appropriate for their hearing loss. And when compared, they preferred that over what was professionally dispensed. Now, these knobs are not ordinary knobs, They're, they have a lot of changes, hundreds of parameters, but we figured out, we found a way to help people fit their hearing aids more easily. And then we sold that technology to Bose and convinced Bose to get into the hearing game. And our first product was more of an experiment. I'm not sure if any of you ever saw it, but it was something that hung around your neck and had headphones that went into your ears. They sounded good, but they didn't look very good. The experiment we ran was if we gave something that sounded great, could it overcome the social stigma of having what looked like a dog collar with earphones in your ears? And the answer was for some people, it was great. But that experiment ended and my employment with them ended when I went on to work at Mass Eye Ear. Now we know years later, Bose came out with their own hearing aid and then decided to exit the business and today that hearing aid is being sold through yet a third company called Lexi as part of this overall over-the-counter hearing aid push. So my next job was at um, Mass Lion Ear. And this was around the time when uh, I was really familiar with the Hearing Loss Association of America. And I remember reading this list, this list of what Hearing Loss Association of America stands for a recognition that hearing is critical to healthy living. You can read this list. You live this list because you espouse these virtues. And an organization that understands it to this depth was an organization that I wanted to be a part of. And working with people like Pete and Jim and Barbara and others, I really see an organization that really lives to make sure everyone with hearing loss has access to these, to these features. And another thing that they help do is come up with this book. So this book is the output of a group called the Institute of Medicine. And the Institute of Medicine is a group of professionals that get together and write and think <clears throat> and come up with some ideas of how to fix a big problem. The Hearing Loss Association of America and a few other organizations paid for this work to be done. And this book, has these priorities for improving access and affordability of hearing for adults. And there are 12 recommendations in this book. And it believes, the authors believe that if we could get at these 12 things, 
hearing healthcare be more accessible and better for all. So to me, I was like, great, this is like an instruction book of how to do it. And so I was looking at a job at Mass Lioneer and I said, I've got the manual of how to do this better. What do you say I start working there and use this book as the way to provide hearing health care? Now, I can't do all 12 of those things, but everything I did at Mass Lioneer was something that was in that book. And if it wasn't in that book, it might not have been worth doing. So I use that as an instruction manual of how to do a better job. And if you haven't read this book, it's free as a download. Um, if you want to purchase it and have it printed, you can do that. But to me, I think this was the best way to really understand what is the problem and what are 12 really good ideas and how to solve it. I wasn't one of the authors, but by being part of HLAA, we were one of the organizations that made this happen. And I think everyone in this room should be proud of this because people who use this book truly are doing a better job of helping adults hear better. So congratulations to all of you. You made Mass Pioneer better because of the work you paid for. And in my time there, it was an empowering and fun place to work. And we're able to do some better things toward making hearing healthcare better. All right. Now, I work for a drug company, and this is the part of the talk that's closest to a conflict of interest, but I do feel I need to tell you what's going on. I work now for a company that's trying to make a drug to help the cochlea help itself and, and fix parts of itself. The drug is in a clinical trial right now, and we're going to know if it works in the first quarter of next year. This is a new thing that's happening, and I'm going to speak more about this in a minute. There are three different efforts to help people hear better with therapeutics. All of them or none of them may make it to market, but I wanna make sure you know about them. One effort is to try to work with tiny babies who have a gene difference and correct that gene difference when they're young. Another is a type of medicine that could block poison. If you need a platinum-based chemotherapy, we believe we can put a drug in the ear to block that platinum poison just there so that that poison can get to the tumor where it needs to go. That would be great for people to save their hearing if they need those powerful but, da but dangerous drugs. And the type of drug that we have is different from those two. Ours tries to get the, the cochlea to regenerate itself just like birds do, just like reptiles do. And just like the cochlea generated itself when we were all tiny babies. Okay, so now is the pause in the, in the talk before I go on to, you know, kind of my view of what's new, where we are in the current state of the hearing healthcare business. Um, so I'm just going to pause for a minute and take a drink. I'm pretty sure we're going to have time for some Q&A, which I, I would welcome um, toward the end. So I'm going to talk about awareness, audiology, hearing devices, and therapeutics. So first, awareness. There's never been a better time, in my opinion, to be talking about hearing loss. It seems that everyone is listening. One of the things I respect about Barbara is she puts herself, well, first of all, she gets asked to be right in front of the microphone and very strategically, she gets to where she needs to be to influence this. But we've got the World Health Organization making a big deal about hearing loss and what we need to do about it globally because not all places have access to the same things. And so countries and regions are each stepping up in their efforts to address hearing loss. And that's great. There was a recent huge report that talked about the size of the problem and the different ways of coming to solutions. This is being talked about worldwide. The Lancet Commission. The Lancet Commission is a, a very fancy group of people who get together and make recommendations about the same importance, often more directed to professionals, but they are too talking about hearing loss. We had a close call for Medicare expansion to include hearing aid coverage. 
every year it comes up and every year it gets a little further. And I think one day it's gonna happen. Hearing aids were written out of Medicare almost by mistake. And that error just hasn't been corrected yet. It needs to be corrected in the work of this organization and others to ensure that this happens starts over again every year. It's like that flower that keeps growing and one day is really gonna bloom, but people are talking about it. Now, I wanna be really careful about this next one. So hearing loss has been shown to be correlated with dementia, dementia depression, falls. But correlation is not causation. You've often heard that. And some people are using this information to say, if you don't get your hearing aids, you're gonna have dementia. Those are unethical practices. And if any audiologist says that, do me a favor, turn around and walk out. There are studies that are underway to try to determine if it's true that if you get a hearing aid, might you reduce the chance of dementia? If it turns out that's true, I'll be the first to espouse those data, but we don't know that yet. So it's an area that's very interesting and very intriguing, and we need to understand more. It does beg to reason that if you can't communicate by not communicating with others, perhaps you're not able to be as social. And if you're not as social, perhaps you're not as able to, to do other things. But before anyone starts making brave claims of using a hearing aid or a cochlear implant or whatever to stave off dementia, Let's make sure the data are in. Regardless, that's making a lot of conversation and it's making a lot of people listen. Um, Coda, Sound of Metal, great movies that put hearing loss in the, in the national conversation. I may not agree with everything I saw in those movies, but I don't agree with anything I see in every movie. But the point is people are interested in hearing loss. People are interested in the stories it has to tell. People are interested in your stories. Brands like Bose, Sony, Apple are making hearing tech. That also changes the technology. No one's ever heard of Phonak or Siemens or all these different hearing aid companies. And so there's no excitement to that, but there is excitement when the current AirPod Pros are better hearing aids than many much more expensive things that are out there. Apple won't talk about that, but they are hearing aids. Bose, we already talked about, I used to work for Bose, and Sony just announced that they're going to get into the over-the-counter hearing aid act as well. So I think a time to talk about hearing loss is now because everyone else is talking about it. And that's great that you gather and have these conversations, talk to your friends, talk to your legislators. There's so much to point to and to turn to to make the conversation more exciting. It's a real good time uh, to get things done. Audiology is under pressure. I ran one of the largest audiology clinics in the world, in the country, when I worked at Mass Eye We had over 50 audiologists across about a dozen sites. It is under pressure, in part because the education is far too expensive for the ability to make money. And so if you are looking at the profession, say, I might want to be an audiologist, but how can I afford to get that much training knowing what my salary is gonna be? I'll just become a physician or an engineer or who knows what else. It can be daunting to take on that much debt to go into the program. But I think the services they provide are very valuable. Physicians couldn't do half their diagnostics without what the audiologist does. The really rehabilitative services, especially establishing expectations for what these devices can and can't do, you can't get anywhere else. But no one pays for advice. So unfortunately, the audiologists, many have had to build a business model on charging for all that within the markup of a hearing aid. And that's also not great because it seems like those hearing aids are also expensive. So that business model of the audiologist, the one who's trying to get out there and be diagnostic and rehabilitative is under a lot of pressure. And they need to demonstrate and earn their value, both from the perspective of people who buy their services like you and insurance companies who pay for it on your behalf. And I'm not quite sure where this is gonna end up. As an audiologist, I really am proud of that work. And then for my colleagues, you know, I, I know how difficult it can be. 
but anyone who's built their business model on, on putting the value seemingly marked up in the cost of a device is surely going to be disrupted. Therapeutics, as I said, are on the horizon. They're not here yet. There are no drugs that can help your hearing get better. The three types I talked about were those, those poison blockers for dangerous drugs, but valuable drugs like cisplatin. They can get injected into your middle ear where the inner ear absorbs them and blocks those poisons. So you can get through the course of treatment where it works elsewhere in the body. The gene therapy for those small number of children who have a genetic hearing loss, perhaps those genes can get straightened out. Um, and then this, this cochlear regeneration for broad populations. All three are in some form of study, and maybe one day they'll be part of the, the uh, options for people with hearing loss. Hearing devices, and, and this, not everyone will agree with this, but essentially they've plateaued in my opinion, from a technology perspective. Yes, new versions are better, but the fundamental value proposition, which is very, very good, is essentially the same as it was 10 years ago, even 20. Now, modern devices can interface with their smartphone and they can do more things, but when it comes to that raw grunt of allowing you to understand this conversation, the good thing about it is you don't, you can, you don't have to rush out and get the next year's version of anything. They may be marginally better, but the fact that you have a hearing device is a good thing, but next year's version and the year before that are essentially just the same. They are effective and they are cost effective and they're wonderful devices to have, um, but there's been no fundamental change to what they've done for decades. Now that they interface with our phones, we can do all kinds of cool things like translations and, and all that. And the, the words artificial intelligence are way overused. Right now, it comes down to automated button pushing, which can be helpful, but it's not the AI we think about when we dream of what someday will be done. I've heard the demos, you may have too, of when you can truly denoise a signal using artificial intelligence, and it is jaw dropping. But right now, it can't run on a processor behind your ear. It just doesn't have the grunt. It doesn't have the power. If you give a computer time to chew through it, powered by the wall, you can hear some incredible demos. But no company, none of them, should be advertising any benefits of AI that make sound more clear beyond selections you could make on your own device. People are working real hard on it. And I think that will happen. But right now, AI is not there yet. Now, despite all kinds of efforts to get people to use hearing aids and cochlear implants, very few people who need them get them. And there's all kinds of reasons for that. And that book that I pointed to before has a bunch that could be relevant. I personally believe that over-the-counter hearing aids are gonna help, but that's not gonna fundamentally transform things. Essentially, you're gonna get the same technology um, and have to deal with it yourself and won't have someone to go ask besides your, your friends here at an HLAA convention how to get things adjusted and do it right. For some people, that will be more than enough, and for others, it won't. So I'm excited about what OTC will do, but I'm not expecting a massive transformation of the entire, um, of the entire field of hearing loss. Okay, now another pause. I'll take a, another drink. So if you heard me speak at the national convention, you heard me talk a little bit about our strategic planning at HLAA. And I wanna make a point of every time I talk to go through these themes, because this is what the board came up with to instruct the organization to make important to them over the next few years, two or three years. Strategic planning is one of the core responsibilities of a board of directors. And strategic planning is not meant to set the direction for 20 years. No one can see that far. So this is meant to be just a two or three freshness period. And these themes, there are five of them. One is expand our engagement. 
seize technology opportunities, broaden advocacy and influence, steward our resources and build a movement. And let me tell you what each of those means. If you look here at this meeting and every meeting, what do we see? A pretty similar group of people. Hearing loss does not look like this. And by the way, it looked just like this in my clinic at Mass Ioneer and everywhere else. We need more race diversity, economic diversity, hearing loss diversity, and age. And those last two often go together. So when we as a board and when HLA as an organization looks to build itself and build resources for others, we need to be more deliberate to ensure that it brings everyone along. You could certainly look to OTC as a successful way, hopefully, of bringing in people with less hearing loss who may be younger into our fold, though they may not feel they're part of the Hearing Loss Association of America, we should all feel very confident that we help them help themselves, whether or not they recognize that. And we are just as successful, even if they don't know that we help them. And when we learn how to provide hearing health care in ways that welcome people of different economic conditions and people of different races, that too will broaden our experience and expand our engagement to many populations that are often overlooked. And I think you see more and more reflected in our writing, in our work, our explicit efforts to do so. We can't define technology. HLA is too small to do that. Big markets define technology, but we can be right there to influence it and shape it. And HLAA needs to be right there when things are getting invented. Can't really invent it ourselves, but ensure that when things come out, our considerations have been considered. I'm sorry. Um, so for example, when these virtual meetings hit the stage and everyone became Zoomers, HLAA worked, we didn't invent Zoom, nor did we invent the captions that show up but we worked really hard to ensure that those captions were available to everyone. It couldn't have been something that we could do alone, but by being in the right place, at the right time, talking to the right people, we can ensure those things got done. Loops are wonderful. And right now there is nothing better when it comes to bringing this microphone to each of you with very little hassle. And there is no other technology easier than that. But, one day there will be. And HLAA needs to be there to ensure that these new standards that are coming out of Bluetooth and Wi-Fi and who knows what else have that same ease and simplicity and fidelity that loops have today. Because one day that too will be made obsolete and something else will be in its place. And we want to make sure that thing is even better. Some of the things that are out there now are getting close, but none have the same ease and fidelity of where we are now. Apps, apps on your smartphones. You've seen good ones, you've seen bad ones. As OTC happens, how do we ensure that these companies don't just put out bad ones and bring the whole user experience along? Again, HLA is not gonna make the app for an OTC hearing aid, but it can influence those that do. And some of the comments and efforts we've made to shape the FDA's ruling reflect the importance of what we can do to seize those technology opportunities. These are all rear view. They still have work to do, but we expect HLAA to jump right in before things are launched to ensure that everyone with hearing losses considerations are put in there. Broaden our advocacy. You know, you've heard the expression, a seat at the table. And I think, I think HLAA has a seat at the table, but I think HLA should be the head of a few tables and HLA should be the one making policy. And you, you see this starting to happen. HLA would traditionally be invited to hear what other people think. And now people are asking HLA what it thinks. And I think that shift from being a seat to the head is a really important strategic shift for the organization to, to ensure that its policies are the first to be considered and that other listen and contribute. 
But we also need to find a, make, find a way to build an infrastructure for state and local governments. It's impossible for the national office to work in all states. But are there ways that it could leave resources for state and local organizations to use resources to be more effective at their level? That way we can influence not only uh, more local governments, but insurance, consumer technology, media, because these all happen everywhere at once. This is how we broaden advocacy and influence. Steward our financial resources. We've gotten better at fundraising, and I'm not talking about fundraising. I'm talking uh, fundraising from individuals, and we have that too, but grant writing, working with our our corporate partners, working in bigger ways, more mature ways of broadening our skills toward those financial resources. We've got a great head of development at HLAA, and she is working with a great team to really bring that fundraising to a next level. And this is a really important momentum to maintain because for HLAA to be effective, it needs to learn how to raise funds better. And lastly, a movement. I Every time I come to a, a chapter or a state organization, I'm reminded of, or a walk for hearing for that matter, I'm reminded of the power of this organization happens when people self-help their hearing loss, where they work together and learn from each other and develop the friendships. I, I saw it at the convention, HLAA saved my life. And that was not an exaggeration. This interaction that happens here, why you've all come here after years, is really the core of it all. But it can't be the only place where that happens as people gather in more in different types of places. So while not, while not taking anything away from this traditional structure, how do we ensure that people can provide that self-help in more and other places? So these five themes are the board's advice direction to the organization to follow. And what's gonna happen now at the next board meeting is for each of the activities that Barbara and her staff do will be reflected into one of these. And if none of these, they'll explain how it fits in and be relevant. So I purposely left about 15 minutes to entertain any questions, but my goals today were to kind of give you a research and technology overview. I think I've done that but I don't wanna be remiss. And I wanted to just tell you a bit of what the national office is doing and how the board of directors work with that national office to do so. So again, I, I'm really appreciative of the invitation to come here and speak. I'm happy to answer any questions for anyone. And I wish you a wonderful rest of your conference. I'm gonna go back to Burlington to be with my daughter, um, but uh, th this would be a pretty good place to be as well. So thank you very much. So happy to answer any questions. I promise I'll repeat the question for captions. I can see some names on the Zoom. I'm not sure who's monitoring the Zoom, but uh, let me know what I can, if there's any perspective I can provide. How will the patients be selected for the trials, the three different trials mm. you were speaking on? The question is how are patients gonna be selected for the types of trials that are involved with the pharmaceuticals? So there is a, big wall that the FDA puts up between the companies and the trials. We design the trials, but we, we cannot do them. <laughs> and that's to ensure no influence gets into them. And um, the way that these trials get advertised will be, will show you how they get, people often say, oh, can I get in your trial? And I say, ah. you can, there's usually a website you can go to. And that website may start collecting information and none of that information comes back to the company. And it all goes through what's called a clinical research organization that has that separation in mind. So there's a couple of ways you can do it. One is you can go to the company websites and look for clinical trial information. That's probably the easiest way. The harder way is every clinical trial that's being done by the FDA is listed on their website. And that has the information of what sites are involved and how you can get there. Now, like many government websites, it's not the most friendly to find that information, but it is all there. Um, just um, an FYI, I loved the Bose earphones, and I was so disappointed when they took them off the market. 
And the feedback I got was, what music are you listening to? I didn't care how they looked. And other people thought I just had headphones on. I was really, they were, for me, a respite from hearing aids because they don't have to go in your ear. And uh, I, I wish they'd bring them back, but I know they're not going to. Seeing that that was well captured, I, I won't repeat it, but I got to say, I use those a lot myself, and um, I can see why the company made the decision, but I also disagree. I wish, I wish they had stuck with it, too. And I think other technology will come in its place. Hopefully, that'll be better. It did break. Kevin, I was waiting to see what would be said about chapters with the five areas of uh, future development. And I'm sitting here thinking without chapters, chapters allow us to well meet each other. And without chapters, none of us would know each other. We would not have come together as a state association, thanks to Dan, and we would not be having this conference. You would not be addressing all of us. To me, chapters, and the grassroots are the backbone of HLAA. And I so badly was hoping I'd see one of those five things really with a focus on continued chapter development. In New York State, we had between, at one time, I think around by 2007, between 17 and 19 chapters in New York State. And now we have six. And they're not even all strong ones. So where do you see, as president of the board, where do you see uh, chapters in the future of the organization? You know, I, I hear you. And I observe people say the same thing. And so I believe, not having found my path to hearing loss through these, I believe that to be fundamentally true. And as you pointed out, New York went from many to fewer. So something is changing, not just within HLAA, but as society in a whole, as a whole. Places where I used to vacation, everyone would get together and do game nights. And those aren't happening now, perhaps as people go home and watch Netflix. So you can't, no one is going to try to replace or dissolve the chapter structure because of what you said. But where do people gather also? And how do we ensure we're in those places also? And I think, again, during the pandemic, we caught a glimpse of this, and it wasn't entirely good, but I went to some shivas. I'm not Jewish. But because of the technology and scale, I was invited into things that I never had done before. Was it the same experience if I was live, no, but I wouldn't have been invited live. And so it allowed me to be part of something different, something similar, but something really powerful. And I think if we can find a way to do both, to have places gather, perhaps smaller numbers with greater crowds, you know, and also have something else, some other thing that can provide a different but meaningful experience, Perhaps that's a way to face this going forward. I don't have the answer. I trust the organization to come up with ideas and do experiments and some will fail and some will go well. So I think going into this eyes wide open to say no one knows the solution, it's not limited to HLAA, but we can never threaten the existence of this physical gathering because it is so key to what the organization is. So I don't know. But I do know that people are gathering in more types of places than in halls like this, you know, at conferences and even at monthly meetings, um, you know, in local communities. I'm, I'm Art Bauer from Rochester. And Sue and I spent a lot of time debating this. Um, the chapter structure we have now is out of 40 years of in-person type of gathering and so forth. And that should go on as, as well as it can. But what I think of is networking on an 
on a non-geographic based basis based upon more subject matter. In other words, there's a lot of mental energy around the United States on these subjects we're talking about. And I'm thinking of a networking model that isn't so much like you think of as a chapter, but working on a particular subject, so to speak, like the technology futures, things like that. And I think you can evolve into that, keep the chapters for what, what they do, but also provide a, an ability to work in groups that aren't geographically based, but are more subject matter based. I don't know how you do that, but that's a model that I just see uh, could happen. Okay. You know, I, I think, you know, the, the perception that the national office comes up with all the ideas and implements them, it's the people in the membership and the people with hearing loss that are going to help build this. So great idea. And, you know, I, I don't want to speak on Barbara's behalf, but if you have ideas for this and need some support for this, this is something you can bring to us to make happen. And I think these are like, I know the get in the hearing loop is perhaps a similar structure where they are organized nationally, have their own meetings around that technology. And as they look to new technologies that may come, um, there's no reason that we can't have experts in one technology speak to the whole country and then have people get together and try things. So I love your idea. And I'm look where everyone's looking for people to, to try them out and, and see that they work and then amplify what does. I'm not sure if this fits into this particular conversation, but one of the things that I've noticed is the prolific use of various drugs that cause hearing loss. Has there been any, you know, looking into what can be done about that, you know, whether it be taking certain drugs off the market, you know, would be one of the obvious, you know, but, but maybe being able to treat situations differently. I, I don't know if that's something that is really in your window of influence, but that's something I'm curious about. Sure. So, you know, when I worked in a hospital environment, you know, drugs that are known to be ototoxic, um, would people who would be taking those drugs had to be, had to make sure they had their hearing tested and regularly monitored and being warned of things like if you start to experience tinnitus or anything like this, to speak to the physician. Uh, you know, I, obviously this happens more with the most dangerous drugs, but to your point, even aspirin can cause hearing loss if taken in too much, in too many quantities. So I think, you know, it's, it's something where pe this will always start with the drugs that are most dangerous, either because of very short periods of high concentration, like with cancer drugs, or prolonged use of something that could um, not be as dangerous like aspirin. Um, these awareness campaigns, I'm not aware of any specific efforts to do a better job of it. Um, there are technologies out there now that people can monitor their own here. And I think that's going to be a good part of it. You saw the World Health Organization, they make a free app called Hear Who, which does a digits and noise test. And, you know, if that can be useful for someone to measure themselves but I, I'm not aware of any specific efforts to do a better job at that. Yeah. I'm John Taylor from the New York City chapter. I'd like to return to what Art Mauro was saying. Uh, Rochester is a very successful chapter. We in New York have also been very successful doing really the kind of thing he's talking about. I mean, you know, you've spoken to us on a number of occasions. We have monthly meetings that are now on Zoom and we get, you know, we've had as many as 125 people at our meetings and they're not all from New York. They're from all over the country. Um, in, in fact, I had a, a friend from New Zealand who even was interested in one of them. And I think some of it really just, I mean, we have good speakers and that's of course important and they're interesting topics, but some of it simply comes down to hard work. We work very hard to publicize our meetings. We notify all kinds of audiologists. We put it in the HLA a leader's calendar, you know, we advertise in a local, uh, you know, uh, online magazine. And it, it, I think it can be done, but it does require some work. And that's, uh, but, but it is it's successful. It's been successful for us. And I understand that we're in New York, we have a larger 
population to draw upon. But as I said, they're not all coming from New York. And Zoom has also allowed us to bring in speakers from all over the place without having to worry about paying you know, speakers fees and expenses. So I, I, I would like to second what Art is saying and saying, just say that you know, it can be done, but it takes hard work. Well, then let me just challenge you to we'll do one more thing is build a succession plan for those hard workers to teach the next generation to follow in your footsteps. That's a very big problem and one that I think we have in New York as well. Our board is, uh, I'm 72 and I'm one of the younger members of the board and building that successful succession plan is, is difficult and we need to find a way to reach out. Yes, diversity along racial, you know, other ethnic things, but age is a very important problem. And I, I don't have an answer to that, except we presenting programs that will attract younger people. But, but again, they can't, they're not gonna come if they don't know about them. And we have to find ways to publicize it. Now, out of respect for the rest of your program, um, it's just about 2.30. I'm happy to stick around for some more questions if you have any for me. But um, as board chair of HLAA, I'm, I'm so grateful to be invited. I'm so impressed by the work you do and you all do to gather because I've heard people say the power of what you do saves lives, and that is not an exaggeration. So thank you very much, and I wish you all the continued success. And anything I or we can do to assist you, please don't hesitate to reach out. My email is chair at hearingloss.org. You have, you already know how to find me. So thank you very much. <laughs>